Since the last episode, we've put a couple of hundred boards through the soldering robot during commissioning, and the Picadev RFID module is nearing completion. So in this episode, we'll show you what we've learned on the soldering robot, and I'll show you some pretty cool stuff that you can do with NFC. Let's do it. Last episode of The Factory, we introduced you to the newest member of the Core Electronics production team, the soldering robot. Didn't have too much to say at the time other than like the capabilities this will unlock for future designs. The ability to solder through whole parts, I don't know, like potentiometers onto, onto your board so that you can have like larger parts or specialty parts that require through hole soldering. Since then we've done a bunch of commissioning, we've soldered up at least a couple of hundred boards and here's what we learned along the way. A soldering robot works just like how you or I would solder a through hole part. You know, it's got a, it's got a hot iron and it's got a feed of solder and it places the iron on the pad that you want to solder and feeds that solder wire into it. There's an X gantry that moves the iron left to right. There's a Y gantry that moves the table forward and back. And there's a Z to drop the iron down to each pad. So we thought a great Hello World project for this machine would be soldering headers onto Raspberry Pi Picos. After all, there's only one type of pad. Up until now, we've actually been hand soldering the Raspberry Pi Picos with headers. If you've received one from Core Electronics, then those Picos have been hand assembled by either Bryce or Liam that work right here. The working area of the robot is one of these. I'm just gonna call it a table. You'll see it has these four corner mounts. And so we whipped up a laser cut fixture plate that keys onto that table. There's a, an, a chamfered corner that is keyed so that it can only go in one orientation. It won't go in upside down, for example. On this fixture plate, we've scattered a 24 millimeter grid of M3 holes. So then on the jigs themselves, we can put this much higher density grid. What that does is buy you some resolution for free. You know, you can have quite a coarse grid here. But as long as you have a finer grid that has a pitch that is a factor of that 24 millimeters, then you get a much higher resolution. So here I've placed the jig in one position, but if that's not quite right, I only have to move it a much smaller distance to register this finer pitch grid with the larger one on the fixture plate. So we get a lot of mounting freedom with where we can put these. From there, we could kind of begin soldering right away. Once you can hold your work on the table, you can begin. This sent us down a rabbit hole of adjusting feeds and speeds. So when, when you're soldering something by hand, you don't just touch the iron to the joint and then bulldoze solder into it and pull it away. Usually there's a little more finesse to it. Maybe you'll preheat that joint. You'll just touch a little bit of solder at first before then putting in like the, the bulk amount of solder. And this machine is no different. It has tunable profiles for each type of pad that you program so that you can set stages of feeds and speeds like preheat time, how much solder to feed at a moment and how fast to feed it. So you can see here an early attempt at soldering with some pretty awful wetting and even a crash of the tip into the pin. You gotta watch out for that too. You can see the, the pads are not soldering very nicely at all. And then after we have things tuned up a little more, you can see much nicer results soldering these Picos. And so on that note about crashing the solder tip, that's an outcome of having just regular soldering pads, these, you know, circular soldering pads that you'd probably be used to hand soldering on most maker modules. Looking in KiCad, you know, I've, I've pulled up a, a pretty regular footprint for a through hole dip component. And this is something that we could probably hand solder quite happily. And this is quite hard to program into the machine because you don't want the tip to hit that pin that's sticking out through the hole and hit the pin directly and, and maybe soften it if there's a connector and push it out of place. So we found a lot more reliability using pads that look more like this, these kind of oval pads. And if you've ever assembled like an old Funway Dick Smith electronic tip, you've probably seen pads that look more like this. There's a much more generous area for the soldering iron tip to touch the pad and then put solder onto the pad, which can then wet onto the component lead when it comes up to temperature. And there's probably some viewers watching that are looking at this 3D printed jigging just real suspicious, like, of course, this is a thermoplastic. What business does it have being used in a soldering jig? It's literally touching the hot pins that are being soldered. This was just an experiment, really just to get like a hello world, minimum viable job running. And it's actually performed really well. These first four units were printed in PLA and it does soften noticeably. After running a job, you can actually squeeze 
the uh, support here and, and close the gap where the pin would normally sit. This last one, we've actually broken out the polycarbonate to print this and it just does so much better. Of course, it has a much, much higher glass transition temperature. So it is handling that kind of duty just fine for now. So yeah, we'll see how we go with the 3D printed jigging. It's pretty nice to be able to just whip it up in house and get it on the fixture plate. But if we need to move on to something more permanent, like a metal jig, then we have the model to proceed with. So yeah, leaps and bounds with the soldering robot. And it's been a minute since we talked about the PicoDev RFID reader. This is in a hardware lockdown, the hardware's done, the libraries are also done. So expect to see this one coming out very soon. I think we got to a really, really nice endpoint. Last time you saw this guy, we were talking about the iterative design process to tune the antenna and matching circuit. And we did a little bit of a demonstration, although it was just on Arduino, but now we have our own library and we can show you what it can do. 99% of people I think are all they're gonna to wanna to do is hold the RFID tag over the reader and get that ID so that you can then do your access control project, your vending machine project, what have you. However, more adventurous users are probably gonna to wanna to do a little bit more. They're probably going to wanna to dig into the, the user memory space of the tag. You know, these have more than just an ID on them. They actually have user programmable memory that you can use to store images, uh, strings if you want, so you can like make your vending machine and have the balance uh, kept track of by the, the tag itself rather than on the machine. Another really cool use for the user program space are URIs. URIs are things like URLs, telephone numbers, you can even do like Wi-Fi SSIDs so you can attempt to connect to a network just by tapping your phone to the tag. Now here's a quick demo. We have a very basic example where all we're doing is programming the Core Electronics website URI onto the tag. So if I run this script, I'll hold the tag over the reader and we've now written that URL to the tag. Get out my phone, hold the tag to the back of the phone and it opens the Core Electronics website. How good. I've only tested this with uh, websites, so URLs like HTTP, HTTPS, telephone numbers, email addresses, you can set it up to like create a new mail to a specific recipient. This is the, the Wikipedia page for a list of URI schemes. And there are just so many. There's like FaceTime links. You can have it open a file, even, even on like a remote directory if you want. So it looks like you can even put in coordinates. Let's give it a go. Google Maps, Core Electronics. Okay, well there's Core Electronics. Google Maps always has the, the latitude and longitude baked into the URL. So I'll just grab latitude and longitude. Go back to funny. I reckon I can comment that out. URI equals geo latitude and longitude. Give that a run. Program the tag, run successful. Pull out my phone, hold, touch the tag to the back and it pulls out those coordinates. And there we are, Core Electronics, how good. So URI is pretty, pretty intuitive to get started with. You just put in that scheme tag at the front and then the data you wanna put in at the back. And this list is pretty exhaustive. There's a lot you can do here. So getting this together to work on Raspberry Pi Pico, Raspberry Pi and Microbit, all with the same user code, did, did have its challenges. Usually in PicoDev we have just one device module, you know, PicoDev underscore RFID in this case. However, because this was quite a lot of code, so much so in fact that it wouldn't actually fit on a Microbit, we decided to split the functionality so that Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Pico get the full function. They can read IDs, they can read and write numbers, strings, URIs, all good. But for the micro bit, we split it in two so that the micro bit would only be able to read the unique ID because that was already enough code just to drive this thing. And we figure that's probably what most people using micro bit are gonna be most interested in anyway. So in our device driver, it looks pretty familiar. Now we have the class, we have the Picadev RFID all the definitions for all the functionality within, but then right at the bottom, there's another 
import command. We check that we're not running on a micro bit. So if we're running on a Raspberry Pi or a Pico, we call another import statement. And this imports into this class the expanded set of features. So we have another file, the RFID expansion, which is right here. And we import all the additional features that are required to say write URIs to the tag. That also means that this expansion file is purely optional. No matter what platform you're running, if the expansion file is included, it will be imported if appropriate. And if it's not included, that just means that you're running with the, the minimum feature set, which is just to read tags unique identifiers. And so here's the kind of range that we can get out of this thing. I'll just bring the tag just to the edge of the range, and that's about 25 millimeters, which is pretty impressive given the size of this coil. You know, we got about 25 millimeters out of one of these generic modules, which has a coil area that's about four times. So I'd say that's a win. NFC tags, very versatile by the look of things. This project has been my first brush up against using URIs. You know, I'd, I'd used NFC tags to like follow links before, but hadn't really explored the inner workings. And it seems like with URI, you can do some really, really powerful stuff. So looking forward to see what you can do with one of these. In any case, that's all I have for you today. If you want to see anything a little bit closer, or if you just have some questions about this content, let us know on the Core Electronics forums. And until next time, thanks for watching.